Jesus is Lord. Welcome, brothers and sisters. My name is Father Al Lauer, and this is Daily Bread. And we're in the 10th part of a 12-part series, giving an overview of the Bible. And the purpose of this series is to really motivate a person to read the Bible. And we're going to talk today about the Deutero-Canonical books. Now, before you turn the TV off or uh, regret getting this tape, stick with us. I believe you'll be pleasantly surprised. So let's stand and let's begin to worship the Lord. We'll pray. We'll ask God's forgiveness. We'll get into the Word of God. This is so important because if, unless we can really receive the Lord's forgiveness and begin to praise Him and worship Him, we will just not be able to receive God's Word. Okay? Let's praise Him right now. I'm going to bless everybody with this holy water. This water reminds us of our baptism when we were made sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. It tells us who we are in Christ Jesus. So, Father, right now we just ask that we might praise You and glorify You and glorify Your Son, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank You, Lord. You're wonderful, Lord. We trust You, Lord. We adore You, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Your Word is true. Oh, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We pray for all our listeners to begin to worship you and praise you, Jesus, to, to the Father through Jesus and in the Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let's sing. Please sing with me, would you? Come, Holy Ghost, Creator blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Come with thy grace, and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made to fill the hearts which thou hast made O comforter to thee we cry thou heavenly gift of God most high thou font of life and fire of love, and sweet anointing from above, and sweet anointing from above. Praise be to Thee, Father and Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. And may the Son on us bestow the gifts that from the Spirit flow, the gifts that from the Spirit flow. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Alleluia. Let's pray now, brothers and sisters. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And also with you. Now we want to ask the Lord's forgiveness. This is so crucial. The Lord wants to give us a word that will change our lives. But if we are in sin, we'll be blinded. And we've had quite a bit of difficulties getting this program on the road. We've had difficulties getting here. Our producer has been sick. And we just need some power from God. And I think God's going to do something. But the devil hasn't been able to stop us, even though he certainly hindered us. And we certainly don't want to give in to him right now. So let's repent of our sins, remove all the obstacles, and open up for the Word of God. Let's repent. Jesus, that particular person is rationalizing their sins. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. Jesus, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine on our darkness. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Jesus, you're the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection, and the life, the bread of life. Jesus, 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 Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we just pray right this moment that many people would listen to this program, that each one who would be called to watch this program would say yes. We ask, Lord, for conversions, for people to give their lives to your son, Jesus, and 
through Jesus to you. We ask, Lord, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for a renewal of confirmation. We ask that the word would be confirmed with cures, signs, and wonders. May pain leave the body of that person right now, even as we pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for reconciliation in that marriage. Sister, you do not have to get a divorce, even though you think there's no other way. Thank you, Jesus, for your power. Thank you for your, your action right now. Thank you for saving your people. Thank you for your bloodshed. Thank you for what's happening this second, even as we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, brothers and sisters, we want you to get out your Bibles. We're going to have a reading from 2 Thessalonians. And this brings up the issue that is central to this discussion and teaching on the Deuterocanonical books. Deutero means second. Canon means the official teachings of the official books of the Bible. So Deuterocanonical means the second measurement, the second statement of the official books of the Bible. Now before you uh, turn off this tape or this program, hang on there. You're going to be pleasantly surprised when we find out about these very precious revelations. So Jack's going to start us off with a reading from 2 Thessalonians. Reading from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. On the question of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we beg you, brothers, not to be so easily agitated or terrified, whether by an oracle, utterance, or rumor, or a letter alleged to be ours, into believing that the day of the Lord is here. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Did you hear that? They were getting confused and people were agitating the Christian community. And how did they do it? Well, by a letter alleged to be Paul's. See, there was the question whether, whether this was part of the Bible or not. And Paul said, that letter you got, that's not the Bible. That is not inspired of God. That's not of the Holy Spirit. But, well, then the question is, well, which ones are inspired and which ones are not inspired? There's many ancient books. There's many uh, writings at the time of Jesus. There's many writings of the Old Covenant. Well, which ones are inspired and which ones are not? How can you tell? How can you tell? Well, whatever is inspired of God would certainly not contradict what we already know, but then there are a lot of books that don't contradict the Bible, but that doesn't mean they're actually the Bible. Hopefully all the books that we've put out, and if you haven't got them, I would want you to write in and we'll send you these books, some of them. Bible teaching books, they don't contradict the Bible, but they're not the Bible. So even if we uh, use that, that doesn't really solve the issue. Well, how do you know what's in the Bible? Well, you know because the Holy Spirit tells you. Well, the, what if one person says, well, the Holy Spirit told me that's in the Bible. And another person said, well, the Holy Spirit told me it wasn't in the Bible. Well, how do you know who's right? Well, you check with the Christian community. And you take some time. And you get some discernment. And then when you put time together and discernment and the, of the Christian community and you just seek what the Spirit is saying, then you find out what really is the Bible and what is not the Bible. And so for many, many years, these books that we're going to talk about were considered to be the Bible. They, and finally, though, especially near the time of the Reformation, some people wondered about these books. And they said, well, they don't think they're the Bible. And then a number of people prayed about it some more, even though it's already been prayed about for well over a thousand years. And they said, no, I really believe it is the Bible. So how do you know if a book is in the Bible? You know from the church. You know from the Spirit working through the church over a period of time. The Spirit working through the church over a period of time, that tells you what's in the Bible. And I think these Deuterocanonical books, even though some of our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ do not accept them as really the Bible, they certainly were accepted by the Christian community for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, I believe that that um, is, is, is enough to qualify them to be truly accepted as the Scriptures. Ultimately, if you really know the Bible well, I don't mean just intellectually, but I mean in a spirit-filled fashion. You can read these books and you can kind of tell. It's the movement of the Lord is, is I'm, in my experience, in the same thing as when I read 
the other books of the Bible that there, where there's no question whether that's truly the Bible? If you're experiencing the same thing, well, then it must be the Bible. Now, of course, you have to really get into the Word. I have to say, even though I've read the Bible for many years, until I had read the Bible for about 20 years, and then in a spirit-filled fashion for about 10 years, I really couldn't tell what was the Bible and what wasn't if the church hadn't told me. But after about 10 years of reading the Bible in a spirit-filled fashion, and many more years just reading the Bible any way I could, I can sense the Spirit. I can discern the spirits, and I can tell whether it's really the Word of God. And I can say these deuterocanonical books, because the church says so, because they meet the basic criteria for uh, telling whether a book is inspired or not, and because of the way the Spirit moves in my life, and I can see it's the same kind of thing as with the unquestioned books of the Bible, I can tell you for sure these, are the, these books are the Word of God. Okay? Do you understand what we mean? These books are the Word of God. Now, what books are we talking about? Well, there are seven books and parts of two other books that are considered deuterocanonical, that are accepted by some believers, but not by others. Now, I'll mention these books, Wisdom and Sirach, Baruch, Tobit, Judith, and First and Second Maccabees. That's seven books, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, Tobit, Judith, First and Second Maccabees. And then parts of two other books, parts of Daniel, and parts of Esther. So we have seven total books and two parts of books, and those are considered the Deuterocanonical books. And as I said before, I can tell you that these are truly the Word of God. Now, what, what do these books reveal to us? What difference would it make whether you had these books in your Bible or not? What do these books reveal to us? Well, I would say these books are primarily about renewal. And I think so many people have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to make a commitment to the renewal of the body of Christ. Now, these books are about renewal and about renewal under the circumstances of hard times. And I believe that right now we're in hard times spiritually. Oh, we're, in, we're not in such hard times financially, although much of the world is, but in this particular part of the world, we're living high, more luxuriously than ever before. But you know, when we get materially in good times, oftentimes we get in bad times spiritually. Because when we start getting material things, we start getting sucked into the world. We start forgetting about the Lord who created it all. We start living the wrong way, putting our treasure not in heaven and on earth, and we get bad times, hard times spiritually, and these cannot, deuterocanonical books are about renewal of the body of Christ in hard times. I'm telling you, that's exactly what's going on right now. Now, let's talk about five aspects of this renewal. Five aspects of this renewal. The first aspect, we find it especially in the book of wisdom, although it's also in 2 Maccabees, some in Daniel to a point. But especially in the book of wisdom, in these deuterocanonical books, a great emphasis on the afterlife. See, in the Old Covenant, there are just some veiled references to eternal life. Most of the Old Covenant more or less thinks when you die, you die. And, and if you live after that, it's nothing to really be too excited about. But of course, that wasn't the full revelation. They did not know about Jesus' victory over death. They did not know that he was a resurrection in the life. They did not know that death no longer had its sting. They did not know that Jesus held the keys of death and of the netherworld. They didn't have that revelation. But, I, but in these deuterocanonical books, they're starting to see what is fully revealed in the new covenant. And so I'm going to read now rather quickly from Wisdom in chapter 3. And here is probably the most clear and the most powerful expression of life after death and eternal happiness. This is Wisdom chapter 3. But the souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed in the view of the foolish to be dead, and their passing away was thought and affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. But... 
They are in peace. The souls of the just are in the hand of God. No torment shall touch them. They are in peace. A very strong statement about happiness, eternal happiness, happiness after death. Now, in order to have a real renewal, people have got to be very clear in their minds that they can risk their lives and not worry about a thing because Jesus will raise them from the dead. Of course, they don't know about Jesus yet, but they're starting to understand the resurrection, at least of the soul or of the spirit from the dead. Did you see? Now, if you don't really have a firm understanding, a firm conviction, a firm faith in the resurrection, well, then you've got really serious problems. Because the devil will use a fear of death to make you a slave your whole life long. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 2. You see? So we're never going to get renewal until we get freed from the fear of death that enslaves a human person. So I hope you understand how a very strong and clear faith in the afterlife is important for renewal. That's holding us back right now. You go to a Christian funeral, a lot of times it doesn't look much different than a pagan funeral. And you know that tells you something, that tells you those Christians aren't really free. Their, their faith in the resurrection hasn't really set them free. And until they get set free, don't expect any renewal. Okay, a second thing that you find in these Deuterocanonical books, and th this is so exciting, there's, tr there's tremendous teachings on spiritual warfare. You know, it says in Ephesians 6, we're not fighting against human forces. We're fighting against evil spirits, principalities and powers, and the prince of darkness and the prince of the regions above. If you can't fight spirits, and of course we're human beings, wouldn't have the power, but in Jesus' name, because he's given us the authority, we've got the power. And if you can't fight spirits in a world under the domination of a spirit, if you can't bind the evil spirit so it will be bound in heaven, if you can't loose the Holy Spirit so it will be loosed on earth, well, you've got some serious, serious problems. You see what I mean? So, of course, even though the Bible, especially in Ephesians, stresses if you don't know how to fight a spiritual war, you don't have a chance in a million. Even though they tell you you've got to do that, they don't explain how to do it very much. There's not too many passages telling you how. There's passages telling you that you sh must, but it, they don't tell you how. Well, the these deuterocanonical books really tell you everything you need to know. Like 2 Maccabees, they tell you all kinds of things about spiritual warfare. Well, 1 Maccabees does too, but, but especially 2 Maccabees. I'm going to read just one section from 2 Maccabees. This is 2 Maccabees 8 and 18. 2 Maccabees 8, 18. They're going into a war with Judas Maccabeus. There's no way he can win this from a natural point of view, but he's going to operate from a supernatural point of view, and that's how you operate in spiritual warfare. 2 Maccabees chapter 8, 18. They trust in weapons and acts of daring, but we trust in Almighty God, who can by a mere nod destroy not only those who attack us, but the whole world. Now listen to that. And he goes on, he tells them about all the times where God just won the battle, God's in charge. The battle belongs to the Lord. Isn't that what David said when he was fighting Goliath? Do you understand? Oh, there's such a revelation about spiritual warfare in the Maccabees books, especially the second Maccabees. Esther, Judith, Daniel, all three of these people were fighting a spiritual combat. They fought this spiritual combat through prayer and fasting and acts of faith. In Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the fiery furnace. And guess what? They just start praising the Lord. They just praise the Lord. They do what Paul and Silas did in jail. They just praise the Lord. They just praised up a victory. They just praised the devil just right out of business. You know, when you look at Esther and you look at Judith, oh, Tobit's in there too. When you look at Daniel and the Maccabees, you have some fantastic teachings on spiritual warfare, the weapons of spiritual warfare, how to just praise and pray and believe the devil right out of business. Okay, that's in the Deuterocanonical books. The third thing for renewal, because if you can't beat the devil, 
You'll never renew the church. A lot of people are trying to renew the church by programs, by education. They're trying to renew the church by their intellect. They're trying to renew the church by talking to people, by modern Madison Avenue fundraising techniques, by all kinds of fancy group dynamics. You're never going to renew the church with all that stuff. You'll never renew the church until you tell the devil to get out of there and go to hell where he belongs. Do you understand? Okay. In the Deuterocanonical canonical books, beside the renewal of the church by getting that freedom that belief in the resurrection will bring about, besides renewing the church by being able to fight the demons, it's the ones that's held the church back. Remember, we're supposed to attack the gates of hell and they can't prevail against us and not vice versa. We also have some tremendous teachings on secular humanism. This is the greatest enemy. This is the greatest enemy of the church in the end times. This is really what I think revelation means by the beast and by the mark of the beast and by the whore of Babylon. It's secular humanism. Secular humanism means that some of them are kind of believe in God, but they don't believe that God's really that much in charge. Man makes the decisions. That's what humanism means. And secular means you kind of focus on this world and don't think so much about heaven. Secular humanism may not have any real firm doctrines that would deny Christianity, but from a practical point of view, it makes Christianity of no value. Now, we need to really learn how to fight secular humanism, but we haven't the slightest idea how to do it. But in the book of Tobit, especially in Wisdom, chapter 2, in 1 Maccabees, chapter 1 and the following, in Sirach, chapter 1 and the following, we have some inspired teaching on fighting secular humanism. Now, to fight an enemy, you've got to know what it is, and that's what makes secular humanism so difficult. It's, it's kind of amorphous. It's hard to really put your finger on it. Some of it comes across pretty good. It's got in the bloodstream of the church. The church was, wasn't wise enough to realize what was going on here. But if you, if you uh, have wisdom, you'll be able to recognize it. You'll be able to smell it out, if you know what I mean. Like in 1 Maccabees chapter 1, verse 13, it talks about how they started secular humanism. Oh, about 175 B.C. when there was the Seleucids are trying to make the chosen people uh, not so chosen. So in 1 Maccabees, this is chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Some from among the people promptly went to the king, and he authorized them to introduce the way of living of the Gentiles. See, secular humanism, like Christianity, is a way of living. It's not so much a doctrine. It's a way of living, and it denies Christianity, which is also a way of living. And they introduced this new way of living, and how'd they do it? They built a gymnasium in Jerusalem, according to the Gentile custom. They used sports, they used entertainment, they used education. See, a gymnasium in that time was really a combination of education, entertainment, and athletics. And we have similar things to the present day. Uh, athletics are really entertainment, but they're really education, sad to say. Oftentimes an education in the ways of the world, in the ways of greed. And this exposes the approach of introducing secular humanism in our culture in a very subtle way. It doesn't always happen through sports, but it happens in subtle ways with things that are partly good, and all of a sudden we're believing the values of the world, and where our treasure is, there's our heart, and our hearts are away from the Lord. We, we see secular humanism unmask in Wisdom, Chapter 2. Secular humanism really is a reaction to death. It cannot handle death and tries to more or less make life just a time of playing. Secular humanism accepts the playboy philosophy, if not in the sexuality, at least in pleasure seeking. Read about it in Wisdom chapter 2. We also see it in Tobit. Tobit is a man who's kind of living in a secular world, trying to be a believer all by himself. Does that ring a bell? Many of you are in that situation right now. Sirach takes human wisdom, takes secular humanistic wisdom, part of which is good, and guess what? Sirach just, just totally overshadows all this human wisdom, partly it's good, with this teaching that it just keeps drumming into people. The fear 
of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord, that's just the opposite of secular humanism. Well, we'll have to move on. Beside a renewal by faith in the resurrection, renewal by how to engage in spiritual warfare, renewal by how to overcome the forces of secular humanism, there's renewal by praise, or the Bible would say by worship, or by liturgy. And all of the, the books of Deuterocanonical books stress worship, or stress a particular time of worship, like wisdom uh, refers to the time of Passover, especially the second half of it. In Sirach, they talk about liturgy. In Baruch, that focuses on the Feast of Booths. In Daniel, they're praising and worshiping in the fiery furnace. In Tobit, they emphasize the Feast of Pentecost. Judith is a reflection on the Passover. Esther goes back to the Feast of Purim. Uh, Maccabees focuses on the feast of the dedication of the temple. All of these are heavily liturgical, or we could put it in other words, they're full of an emphasis on worship, communal worship. And the last thing that these deuterocanonical books teach us is to guard against idolatry. Idolatry is not just some kind of statue that you bow down before. Idolatry is selling out to the world. Idolatry is throning your TV set. Idolatry is really worshiping, but not the true God. You know, everybody has to worship. But sad to say, you might not worship the true God. In Daniel, those last couple of chapters, also in Baruch, there's quite an emphasis on be careful. Be careful you don't do worship of a false god because you're going to worship even a person who says I never worship you worship you worship everybody uh, has a, uh, observes Sunday everybody observes the Lord's Day but do they honor the real Lord or do they worship themselves or worship demons do you know what I'm talking about oh the Deuterocanonical books open up the, the so much and we just ask that you would go and read them I don't think you'll be disappointed at all with this little background, you'll know what to look for. Let's pray right now. Father, we pray that each person watching this program would pick up their Bibles and start reading. And we pray that the Word would come alive in their hearts. We pray that the Word would affect a change. And most of all, we ask that the Word would lead everyone to your Son, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you're our resurrection. Jesus, you're our Lord. Jesus, you're the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, you're the high priest. Jesus, you are God. You are God alone. Three persons in one God alone. Amen.